Good morning, Gateway. Welcome to our Sunday service. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen.
Father, for sending your son to be born on earth, for he has washed all our sins clean. He is such a good and awesome God. Amen. Thank you, Gateway, for worshiping with us. Before you have a seat, please greet the person to your front back. Hey Gateway, happy Sunday and welcome to church. We're so glad that you're here with us today. If you're a guest with us today, we want to say an extra special welcome to you. We are so glad that you made the decision to come and join us at Gateway this morning. We pray that you feel so encouraged and welcomed in today's service. Through this Christmas season, make sure you're staying tuned to our online church calendar for everything you need to know that's happening here at the church. This week, we do have connect groups happening on Wednesday night, our connect group at 7 o'clock. Also, Gateway Youth Movement, Friday at 7, it is your Christmas party. And then on Saturday, we will once again be having the Gateway Men's Breakfast Connect Group at 8 to 9 a.m. at the McDonald's in the Everest parking lot, as well as our Gateway Prayer Hour on Zoom at 2.30. To ring in the new year, our Gateway Connect group that happens on Saturday morning for a book reading will be starting a brand new book by Joseph Prince, The Power of Right Believing. This Connect group will commence on Saturday, January 7th at 9.30 a.m. And if you would like to join, books are available for purchase. Just call the church office and let us know that you would like to be included in this book reading. Something very special happened here on Friday night at our Comfort and Joy party. It was a great night and we want to say a huge thank you to every single volunteer that gave of their time to make this event happen. You know, we had volunteers that started preparation for this event weeks ago, constructing some of the beautiful things you saw here on Friday night. Also, we had volunteers here all throughout the week making this place a Christmas wonderland. We had volunteers that served the night of the event. So we want to say a huge thank you to you, Gateway. You got behind this event and made it the special night that it was. So thank you so much for serving at Comfort and Joy 2022. We cannot wait for next year. Christmas Eve is right around the corner and on Saturday, December 24th from 6.30 to 7.30, we are having our annual Christmas Eve candlelight service. This is a special time of the year and we want to encourage you to make this candlelight service one of the focal points of your Christmas celebration. We wouldn't be celebrating Christmas if Jesus didn't come to earth in the form of a baby and be born. So we want to encourage you, pack up your friends and family and invite them to join you on Christmas Eve at 6.30 right here at the church. Let's get together on this special evening and celebrate the birth of our Savior together. And an extra special Christmas gift for us all this year is that Christmas Day is on Sunday. That means we are going to get together again and celebrate Jesus being born on Christmas Day right here at 11.30. We will only be having one service, so we want to encourage you, get up, have breakfast, open presents, and then put church next on your agenda for Christmas Day. This is a special thing that happens very rarely, so we want to encourage you, come on out on Christmas Day and celebrate the reason for the season, Christmas right here on Christmas Day. So see you on Christmas Day at 11.30 right here at the church. Thank you, Gateway, for continuing to give into God's house as we close out the year 2022. God has been so good to us, and we are blessed to continue to be a blessing and be obedient to God's word and bring our tithe into his church. So there's three ways that you can continue to give today. The first is by giving in person by dropping your giving in one of the giving boxes. The second is by giving online. Head to gatewayonline.ca slash give and follow the prompts. And the third way is by text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's on the screen right now and follow the prompts. That's all I got for you, so have a great week. We'll see you right back here next Sunday. And Pastor Brian, over to you for the next part in our series, Best Christmas Ever. All right, good afternoon, Gateway. And I also want to add my very special vote of thank you for everyone who in any way helped to make comfort and joy happen on Friday night. Yeah. That was a terrific evening. I just know what some of you are thinking. Man, I should have gone down that slide while I had the chance. <laughs> well, thank you very much for showing up, for inviting others, and, and of course for volunteering with all of the preparation. And thank you to those who showed up as volunteers yesterday to take down. Believe me, taking down is a lot quicker than it is when we put it up. But... Uh, uh, thank God for comfort and joy. That was a very special 
event. So today we are continuing our Christmas countdown sermon series. And, and uh, on that theme of Christmas, how many of you are looking forward to enjoying a turkey dinner or two or three in the weeks ahead? There was one family who were having a Christmas gathering. And when the Christmas dinner was over, somebody asked the little boy, did you like the turkey? He said, not really, but I love the bread that the turkey ate. <laughs> Otherwise known as stuffing, right? Come on. Before we get into this message today, would you stand to your feet and would you boldly repeat after me, I love God. Therefore, I love the Word of God. The teachings of Jesus are my greatest counsel. My pride and passion is to follow his example. See, the Bible is truth to my spirit, joy to my soul, and health to my body. Help me, Lord, to know the book and walk the walk. Can you say amen? amen. Come on, somebody give some praise. Yeah, praise the name that is above every name. All right, well, you may be seated I believe that you are ready to receive the word today. And just a quick word to those who are joining us online. Welcome to Gateway. Welcome to the Word of God where we find all of the answers to the questions of life. Anybody want to say amen to that? It is such a true word. All right. So we are picking up our series called Best Christmas Ever. And we've been identifying over the course of recent weeks some of the reasons why we might refer to a Christmas as our best Christmas ever. In part one, we talked about get organized. We followed that up in part two with get married. And then it was get saved in part three. Part four was get involved. So many of you did that concerning this whole comfort and joy event. And again, thank you. Thank you for having a heart to serve the Lord and serve others. Last week was part five in our series. We talked about get blessed. So if you missed any of these sessions in this series, of course, you can always go online and get yourself signed in for pay-per-view. No, I'm just kidding. It's free. It's all free. All right, today, this, uh, this message is going to be part six in our series, and we're talking today about get together. Everybody say, get together. Folks, would you agree with me? This is such a huge part of our celebration of the season of Christmas. So much getting together with family and friends and church family. Just turn to your neighbor right now and say, what time would you like me to be there? <laughs> Yeah, that's what we do. Christmas time, we get together. There's no secret that one of the things that we major on in this Christmas season is family reunions. You know, I find it really quite ironic that, that Jesus was born at a time when family reunions were actually being mandated by the Roman government. Allow me to jog your memory today from the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, beginning to read in verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Of course, Israel was living under the rule of the Roman government. That's why they had to be a part of this census-taking project. Everyone went to their own town to register, verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because Joseph belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and she was very much expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. There was no room in the inn. No wonder the motels all had their no vacancy signs on. There were so many people who were traveling home for this, this census, this, 
this taxation that they were required to be a part of. And so there was a, a lot of visiting going on with family and friends that people hadn't seen for years. Now, in the case of Mary and Joseph, did you ever stop to wonder about this? Why would they need to seek lodging at the inn? Like, didn't Joseph have relatives that were still living in the Bethlehem area? No doubt it's a safe assumption that he did. Why were, why were they not looking to, 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 you know, to connect with relatives and get lodging from Joseph's family instead of trying to find a place at the inn? Could it possibly be that they were not welcome to stay with Joseph's family because of their situation? Because of their circumstance, right? Now, it's pure speculation on our part, but why didn't they camp with Joseph's relatives? Well, could it be that his family suspected that Joseph and Mary had been promiscuous? Maybe, maybe they, they, they heard about what was going on with Joseph and Mary. They're going to have a baby. And, and maybe they, they judged them as, as having you know, behavior that was kind of scandalous. You're not staying with us. Like, who would blame his family for not believing the story about this miraculous conception? See, where you and I sit from our perspective, okay, we have a vantage point here 2,000 years later. By now, there is no doubt whatsoever in our mind. Jesus was born by miraculous conception the holy spirit came over mary uh, mary and 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 what do you know she is now going to have a baby 9 months later so these stories are circulating but but for you and i that's easy to believe because we know the history we have the word of god in front of us but at that stage of the game they had never heard of such a preposterous thing can you just about hear Joseph's uncle saying, yeah, right, miraculous conception. Come on, Joseph. You see, that original Christmas raises the question of a family gathering that can go one of two ways. It could be a very happy reunion, or it could be a time of arguing and strife and hard feelings or even controversy in the family. Now, in this series, week by week, we've been pointing out the difference between best ever and worst ever. I think all of us can comprehend the striking contrast between best Christmas ever or worst Christmas ever. You see, if the whole family comes back home and it's just a beautiful get-together, lots of love and, and laughter, it could rank right up there as one of our best Christmases that we can ever remember. But on the other hand, what if the family tries, I said, tries to do the Christmas t t celebration together? They try to do what we're talking about today, get together. But it turns out to be a disaster. You know, the old family rift raises its head up again. And we've seen this story before. There's a harsh exchange between so-and-so and another person in the family. And there's resentment. And somebody leaves in a huff. And it has the potential to become worst Christmas ever again. You know, one time there was a grandmother who was looking after her grandson, and he said to her, Grandma, I can say the Lord's Prayer. Do you want to hear it? She said, yes, of course, certainly. Recite for me the Lord's Prayer. And so he started out, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He went through the whole prayer, and he got it perfect, except for one line. He said, and forgive us our Christmases as we forgive those who Christmas against us. You know, that young boy, he might be on to something. How many of you have ever had some? Oh, don't put your hand up, but have you ever had somebody that Christmased against you? 
Or maybe you've been the one that Christmased against somebody else. Many have had this experience, folks. When we think about this idea of getting together with loved ones, there's another way that we can see the comparison between best Christmas ever or worst Christmas ever. So if a group of people get together to celebrate and they have just a wonderful Christmas, I mean, it's got all the makings of best Christmas ever. Ever just kind of makes you want to break out into song, joy to the world. So you got a family that has just a sweet Christmas season together. But meanwhile, there are other people on that very same Christmas day, and they are by themselves. They're feeling lonely. They're feeling left out, maybe even depressed. They're feeling just the opposite of get together. Because they're, they're just on their own. See, they're feeling that lousy emotion of worst Christmas ever. You know, over the years, Barb and I have had some pretty special Christmases, although there's been probably some that were a little bit tarnished as well. It hasn't all been a perfect, you know, storybook scripting. But there's a Christmas that I will never forget. We were pastoring out in Halifax at the time, and the kids were, were young, and, and, and both of our families were back in Alberta and Saskatchewan, respectively. And, and, and so Christmas was, was getting closer, you know, a couple of weeks away. And, and, and so we got an idea. Well, more likely it was Barb had an idea, and Brian went along with it, right? I mean, you know, ever since I've known this girl, she has a strong mercy gifting in her system. And, and so here, here's the deal. There was a number of individuals in our church who simply did not have family in the Halifax area to celebrate Christmas with. And so we invited all of these people to come to our place for Christmas. Yeah, That's that. we're, we're, we're going to become one big happy family over at the Larrett place. And so we extended the invitation, and what do you know? They, they were all happy to come. There was a single-parent mom with her little girl. There was a couple of young men from Nigeria that were studying at the university. Obviously, they weren't going to be going all the way back home for Christmas. There was a couple of older people in the group and just a whole variety of, of people. And we just all kind of packed in. It wasn't a very big place, but, but we got together. There was probably about a dozen of us all together. And, and, and there was one thing that we had in common. We all missed our, our family, and, and so we did this get-together thing, and we became one big happy family with Jesus as the guest of honor, and I'm telling you, it was just one of my favorite Christmases ever. We sang together, yeah, we prayed together, we read the Christmas story together, we ate together, we laughed together, we opened gifts together, we celebrated Christmas together. I'm telling you, it was one of those experiences you just didn't want it to end. You didn't want the evening to be over. We just were totally enjoying one another's company in Jesus' name like best Christmas ever. So when I think about this expression, get together, wow, that memorable Christmas back in the early 90s definitely comes to mind for me. How many of you know what I mean when I say there are some things in life that are never meant to be done alone, right? Who goes to the theater to watch a movie all by themselves? I suppose some people do, but normally, hey, find somebody to come with you to go and check out that new movie. Uh, how about water skiing? What are you going to do? Put that boat, boat on cruise control, put your skis on and jump out the back end of the boat. Probably there's only one guy that I know that actually could pull that off. That'd be Dave Budding. He is a master water skier. But what else is on the list of things that were never meant to be done alone? How about having an argument or playing tennis or giving a hug? How about we add to that list celebrating Christmas? Come on. Everybody say, get together. 
Of course, that's how you're supposed to celebrate Christmas. Get together, folks. Have you noticed that every week here at Gateway, we feature a specific aspect of what it means to be a believer? And there are many such aspects. But the one that I want to emphasize today is bound up in a really, really special word that's in the original Greek language of the New Testament. It's the word koinonia. Everybody say koinonia. Yeah, I know, I know. It sounds like a Japanese laundromat, but it's not. This is a big time special word in God's economy, koinonia. This is a word that is translated into our English Bible with words like fellowship, communion. Yeah, this is about community. This is, this is a word that carries the connotation of togetherness. Folks, koinonia is the term that describes close knitness, unity, the culture of togetherness of the church. Come on, just turn to your neighbor and say, I am wired for koinonia. You certainly are. You see, when we make that personal decision, to believe and receive Jesus as our Savior, you know, because somebody cared enough to lovingly confront us about our need for Jesus. And, and, and so we come to understand why that, 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 that cross, why that hideous cross that the, that the sinless Son of God would be required to die the, the death of a criminal on that old rugged cross. Like, why in the world would that be necessary? Because he was taking our place. Because he was taking our blame. Yeah, he was a substitutionary, sacrificial lamb. And he got the job done. He paid the penalty and took the judgment of God concerning the sinfulness of the entire human race. Folks, this is the good news. It doesn't get any better than that. And so us becoming followers of Jesus, it all hinges on a simple act of of faith that we say, Lord, I get it. You died in my place. You dealt with my crazy sin factor. Lord, I am so ready to get myself in gear and follow you from now on. Lord, I'm going to follow you all the way to heaven. And so we pray and say, Jesus, what am I waiting for? Please come into my life and forgive my sin. From now on, I want to be all about living in a way that is God-honoring. And so when we experience this spiritual rebirth, guess what? You become a practitioner of this thing called koinonia. Yeah, a person who cherishes people. I'd like to read a few verses for you this afternoon from Acts chapter 2, where we find just a beautiful description of the flavor of fellowship, the flavor of, of koinonia in that original church. So it's, it's, uh, it's Acts chapter 2. So the Holy Spirit was poured out and, and boom, 3,000 people turned their lives over to the Lord. And that was the, the planting of the original New Testament church, which continues strong to this day. And you and I get the privilege of being a part of it. But when they launched that New Testament church, here's what their fellowship look like. As I read these verses, I want you to watch for the spirit of koinonia, okay? The togetherness that we pick up on in these verses. 42, verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, it says, they devoted themselves, the believers, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. That's that word, koinonia. And to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves to communion, which is koinonia. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. There's that word again. They were together and that had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had a need. Every day they continued to, there it is again, to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Wow, that early church had it to gather. Apparently, Christians in every generation, we've always been known for food and fellowship, right? 
difference is before you come to the, to, to the Lord, we have this, this thing called a potluck supper. Now we call it a pot blessing supper, right? But relax, it doesn't have anything to do with cannabis, all right? But, you know, there, there are some denominations where I'm convinced they actually believe you cannot get into heaven unless you bring a casserole. That's not true. You can't bring anything with you, right? Listen, the point is, cherish your opportunities to get together, to hang out, to love one another. Do you know why they call this COVID thing COVID-19? It's because it began in the year 2019. And now, my friends, we are knocking on the door of 2023. My goodness, this thing has been dragging on and on. That's a significant chunk of time. And I believe that if there's anything that the Lord wants us to learn from this ridiculous season called COVID, this pandemic, I think the takeaway for us is that we get it and we get it good. We get this thing lodged deep down inside. The truth about the pandemic is we need one another. That was a weak amen. Come on. Everybody say, we need one another. Of course we do. One of the most often quoted and preached verses during these past couple of years is from Hebrews 10, 25. It says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the habit of some is, but instead, yeah, get together and encourage one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day would that be? The day when Jesus comes back again. He uses a very interesting word in this verse. He says, do not forsake. 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 That means you, you bail on somebody. That means you abandon somebody. Do not forsake the getting together of the church. Do not forsake the body of Christ. Do not forsake the Lord by forsaking the people of the Lord. Those two are inseparably connected. You cannot uh, split between the Lord and His people. Do not forsake the family of God and the family reunion that takes place on any given Sunday. Do not forsake this idea of getting together with fellow believers. They say, welcome to the family of God. It is a mutual encouragement community. Folks, may I humbly offer you some friendly suggestions this afternoon that will help to govern all of your getting together with family and friends this Christmas season. Would you be open to receive it? Come on, let's talk about how can we do better? How can we enrich our, our special times of connecting with family and friends? All right, for all of you that are note takers, number one is this. Be inclusive, not exclusive. Is there someone that you ought to invite to join you in your circle of Christmas celebration. Oh, I say, Holy Spirit, lead us. Help us to have our wits about us and to take notice if there's someone that maybe doesn't have somebody to celebrate Christmas with and, and we could include them in our celebration. Wouldn't that be just so good? I love the statement that's made in Psalm 68, verse 6. In the King James Version, it goes like this. God sets the solitary in a family. In the NIV, it says this. He sets the lonely in a family. Wow. That's, that's so good the way the Lord ordains these connections. You know, somebody's having a big celebration and they notice somebody else that, you know, they, they just don't, don't seem to have any plans for Christmas. Well, hey, come and join us. That's beautiful. That's just like the Lord to take an individual and add them to a family. Wow. Please note, you cannot just start randomly inviting people. Thou shalt confer with thy spouse. <laughs> Honey, what do you think? How about we invite so-and-so? Sweetheart, that's a great idea. Go ahead and give them a call. All right. That's how you do it, man. You, you cannot just, just go off on your own, just in, indiscriminately inviting whoever you want, and then they show up, and your spouse says, 
Who invited them? <laughs> Just ask the guy who, who ran into an old friend one day downtown. They hadn't seen each other for years, old school buddies, and they started chatting it up, you know. And then this guy said, listen, why don't you come over tonight and join my wife and I for supper? And his friend said, well, you think your wife would mind? Oh, no, she got the gift of hospitality. She would be, be so glad. But listen, I'll let her know. So he gave him the address and the time, and and the guy said, okay, well, I, I will come, and we'll be able to do some more catching up. That'd be great. And, and so he came, and, and uh, th- th- this guy called his wife during the afternoon. He said, honey, I, in- I ran into an old friend, and-, and I invited him to come for supper with us tonight. Is that okay? And she said, yeah. She said, I, I would love to-, to meet your old friend, but just keep in mind, I only have three servings worth of ice cream, okay? So, so don't be asking your friend, you know, would you like seconds on the ice cream? Because that's all I've got, one serving per person, okay? And he said, okay, yeah, that's no problem, sweetheart. So guy came over, and they had supper together. They had dessert, you know. They served up the ice cream. And then this guy said to his friend, he said, hey, Charlie, w- w- would you like some more ice cream? Uh, no, thanks. A few minutes later, he says, are you sure we couldn't offer you seconds on the ice cream? And he said, "Uh, no, actually, you know what? I think I need to be going. And he kind of abruptly left. And and, and, and no sooner did he get out the door, and, and, and this guy's wife turned to her husband, and she said, what were you doing? He said, what do you mean? She said, I told you we only had three servings worth of ice cream. Why did you ask him if he wanted more? And he said, oh, Honey, sorry about that. I guess I forgot. You forgot? Why do you think I was kicking you under the table? He looked at her and he said, kicking me? You never kicked me. <laughs> Listen, if you want to invite somebody, talk it over with your spouse. Make a plan. It could become one of the best Christmases ever for that person that you add to your circle of celebration, whereas they might have had one of their worst Christmases if they were just left alone. All right, number two is coming at you. Here it is. Be an agent of reconciliation. Yeah, be a peacemaker. Be that person that is a promoter of unity, not the one that causes the disunity. How many of you have been in a family Christmas gathering where where somebody was at odds with a another member of the family, you know, and it's kind of unsettling for everybody in the entire household. I say, don't let there be an elephant in the room, you know. Everybody knows that so-and-so is mad at so-and-so, but nobody wants to address it. Don't let that happen. Don't spoil Christmas by harboring a grudge. If you're the one, if you're the one that is upset with somebody else, I say, for goodness sake, forgive, forgive. Forgiveness is such a Christmassy thing to do. Not only that, forgiveness is such a Christian thing to do. Remember what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. He said, if someone has something against you, or for that matter, if you have something against somebody else, go and make it right with them, and then come and give your offering to the Lord. Yeah, in a Christmas celebration, go and make it right with so-and-so. And and then come and offer your Christmas gifts to the family, right? Someone put it like this. Unless we make Christmas a time of forgiveness, all the snow in Canada won't make it a white Christmas. Somebody say amen. Just turn to your neighbor right now and say, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Forgiveness is so powerful. Don't let unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, don't let that wreck your celebration of the birth of our Savior. I love Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as what? As white as snow. Yeah, what a beautiful picture of forgiveness. When you wake up in southern Saskatchewan and there's a fresh blanket of snow across the countryside, you look out your window, it just should be such a witness that rises up in your spirit. You say, oh, thank you, Lord. I am forgiven. It's a powerful image, isn't it? 
Listen, you cannot control other people. You know, their attitudes, their emotions, their decisions. You can't, you can't be responsible for the other person's side of the issue, but you certainly can be responsible for your side of the relationship. Remember what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, okay, on your end of this thing, if it's possible, as much as possible, as far as it depends on you covering your end of the conflict, live at peace with everyone. If you do your part, hopefully the other person does their part. Certainly the Lord will do his part. Yeah. All right, let's move on. What else do we have here? Number three is this, be affectionate affectionate yeah come on you're with family or or close friends and it's christmas christmas is such a special time of year don't get all awkward if somebody tries to give you a hug now i get it that there there are some families that are not huggers and there's other families that 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 certainly are huggers but i'm telling you there's something very powerful about human affection when it's appropriate now, this, this is an area where the Lord has really done uh, a number in me because in my young days, wow, I was definitely not inclined to hug people. I was incredibly shy. But the Lord has done a work in me, and now I am so open to give hugs. And, 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 and the Lord has brought me a little bit further down the, the track of spiritual maturity. So now I, I, I'm a person who will hug, but, but when it's appropriate to do so, right? Because it's not always appropriate, but man, there's something about expressing your affection, expressing your appreciation, and reaching out to, to give somebody a hug, to give somebody some, some words that are deeply meaningful. Yeah, I I'll never forget Robert. Robert was a young man who worked in the meat department at Sobeys, and and so Barb and I, when we would be in the store there, we, we would chat with him a little bit. We got to know him. And, and what do you know, in due course of time, more Barb than myself, because she's in the store more. That, that doesn't mean she eats more than I do. But, you know, she did more of the shopping and the cooking than me. And so she really got to know Robert well. And what do you know, she led him to the Lord. And he made the decision and he prayed to receive Jesus a few months later. He's walking down the street. I'm out on the front lawn raking the leaves. It's in the fall of the year. And, and, uh, and here comes Robert. He's got his little boy up on his shoulders. And he said, Pastor, I, I couldn't wait to tell you this. He said, I walked over here. And, and, uh, and he said, you know, I, I went home to visit with my family. I said, yeah, I, kn I knew that you were going to be going. He said, Pastor, here's what happened. I was sitting in the living room, and my dad was sitting in his chair. And just out of the blue, I said to my dad, Dad, I just want you to know that I love you. And he said, Pastor, my dad said, Robert, I love you. And my dad started to cry, and we hugged. I said, well, that's, that's great. He said, no, Pastor, you don't get it. That is so amazing. I can't ever remember saying to my dad, I love you. And I cannot ever remember in my whole life hearing my dad say that he loved me. And I've never seen my dad cry. And my dad and I have never hugged that I'm aware. I said, oh, Robert, this is proof positive that Jesus really has done a work in your spirit, soul, and body. You are truly born again. That is so amazing. This is the kind of work that the Lord wants to do in us. If there's been a wall there, if there's been resistance there, Dear Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, give us that liberty to be able to reach out and engage with other people that are special and important in our lives. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. This Christmas season, you are going to have opportunities to be on the giving end or the receiving end of words and gestures of affection. And all I want to know is what are you going to do about that? Are you going to just draw back? Or are you going to engage and, and, and love people and allow yourself to be loved by people? So be affectionate. Let's move on. Number four is this. Be comforted. 
By that I mean, if this is the first Christmas since a beloved member of your family circle has passed away, would you allow the Lord to minister to you? I'm telling you, the grace of God is sufficient for you. Talk about that person who is now missing at the Christmas dinner table, but let their name come up freely in your conversation and, and be encouraged and trade those stories about your fond memories. But whatever you do, do not allow their missingness to cast some kind of a shadow or a heavy wet blanket over your Christmas. No, don't let that happen. They wouldn't want that to happen. The Lord wouldn't want that to happen. The grace of God, the peace of God is sufficient for you. You know, the other day we were getting ready for comfort and joy, and I was reminded of a few years ago when our son Jordan was still with us, and, and, uh, and it was this time of year, and it was the week before comfort and joy, and so we were just right up to our, our elbows in preparations, and Jordan was utilizing some of his carpentry skills, and one evening he and I were working on a project out there, and, and, uh, and you know, it was getting late in the evening. We just continued to work on that project, and, and then what do you no, we just kept working and talking, and, and we pulled an all-nighter. We worked right on through the night. The rest of the building was just all quiet, but there we were going, going at it, getting ready, you know, because comfort and joy is only a couple of days away, and, you know, there's a time pressure. We got to get some of this stuff done, and we just worked right through the night and on into the next day, and then we slept finally the following night. And now that Jordan is not with us, he's in heaven, I'll tell you, that is now just a really special memory for me, as you can appreciate. It's a good, a healing thing for me, even just to be able to talk about that with you. Is there somebody in your family that is now, you know, gone home to be with the Lord and it leaves a, an emptiness? At the table, it leaves an emptiness in your heart, and you just, you just feel like, oh, man, Christmas isn't the same without them. Just call on the Lord and receive the Lord's healing grace. Somebody say amen. You know, there was one lady who was getting up in years, and she knew that she would soon be going to be with the Lord, and she wrote a poem for her family and friends. Here it is. She wrote this. Here lies a woman who was chronically tired, for she lived in a place where help wasn't hired. Her last words on earth, dear friends, I am going where washing ain't done, nor sweeping, nor sewing. And everything there is exact to my wishes, for angels are the ones who do the dishes. So don't mourn for me now, don't mourn for me never, for I am going to do nothing forever and ever. Just turn to your neighbor and say, in heaven, you can skip the dishes. <laughs> Doesn't exactly fit with our theology because we know that in the heavenlies, we are going to be actively engaged with responsibilities for serving the Lord. But we get the idea she doesn't want them to be grieving over her at Christmas or any other time of the year. All right, quickly, let's see if we can cover two more points here. Number five is this. Be a creator of wonderful memories. You see, it is the responsibility of mom and dad to give their kids good manners, good morals, good memories, and best of all, the good news about Jesus. Can I run that by you again? Come on, parents. It's your job to give your kids good manners and good morals and good memories and, most of all, the good news, the gospel. But let's talk about that third one for a minute here because this is, this is not something that we talk about very often. Good memories. You know, when I was a kid, there was a Christmas when we did that traditional thing of going to cut down our own Christmas tree. Yeah, we cut down a beautiful tree off the front lawn of the legislative uh, 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 property. They're right out in front of the legislative building. That's a lie. 
We did not do that, but we did go out of town to a property that was owned by a man who was a friend of my dad, and so we had permission, and off we went and trudged through the the deep snow, and we had an axe with us, and we picked out that tree, cut it down, brought it back into the city, and decorated it in our living room just like we read in that Christmas storybook, and it was just amazing. I I still have that as a fond memory in my heart, the year that we cut down our own Christmas tree. That is just an amazing thing, tromping through that snow. Yeah, the only thing that was missing was the sleigh and the horse and the jingle bells, but, but we got our tree. Somebody say amen. Yeah, but fast forward a number of years, now I've got kids of my own, and I'm thinking, I am going to duplicate that wonderful memory for my own children. And we were living in an area where they had these Christmas tree farms, and you could go and pay your money and go out and choose your tree and cut that thing down and take it home with you. And that's awesome, but the day that we went to do that, it was raining. And the place was all muddy, and we cut down our tree, and over it went. And the tree is covered with mud, and we got that thing loaded into the the hatchback of our our car. And now the car is all muddy, and I was all muddy, and I was soaking wet. And it was a miserable uh, experience. It was anything but a a, a great memory. But I'll tell you what, there's so many ways that you can. You can find ways to create some really special memories for your family circle. There was one lady who was talking to her friend one day, and she was explaining that she received this this letter from her son who was away at university. And she said, wow, that letter means so much to me. And she related how her son had written and said, Mom, I just want to thank you and Dad so much for those those family ski trips that we used to take every year during our teenage years, and we would go during the Christmas break. Thank you so much. That was awesome. And she's telling her friend about this. She said, you know, every year we used to save money and save and save and save, and we were saving up so that we could renovate the, the bathroom in the basement. And every year without fail, we would take that money that we saved up to redo the bathroom. And instead, we would spend it on this family ski trip during the the, the Christmas break. And then she said this. She said, you know, somehow I just cannot imagine my, my son writing a letter home and saying, Hey, Mom and Dad, thank you very much. It's really a swell bathroom we have down in the basement. She said, we never did get that basement bathroom renovated until all the kids were grown up and moved out on their own. I'm telling you what, if you think about it and if you ask the Holy Spirit, you might be surprised at some of the brilliant ideas that the Lord will deposit into your spirit, ways that you are able to be a creator of wonderful Christmas memories. I say go for it. All right. Number six, finally, be on the lookout for the man of peace. Allow me to explain what I mean by that. Christmas is just such a perfect opportunity for outreach, right? For sharing our faith with others, inviting people to special Christmas events. And in many cases, you're going to find yourself in a mixed gathering, right? So there'll be some family members who are believers and others who are definitely not Christians, at least not yet. And it can create a little bit of tension in the house. But listen, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent out the 70, 35 teams of two, and he gave them instructions. And he also told them what to expect. In verses 5 and 6 of Luke chapter 10, Jesus said this. He said, whatever house you enter into, if you try to speak the blessing of God, if you try to give them that shalom, that peace of God greeting. There are some people who will flatly refuse, but there are others who will be the man of peace. What does that mean, the man of peace? Somebody that's open. Some, somebody that is actually sympathetic to your position as a Christian. They're not contrary. They're actually interested. Oh yeah, there's a man of peace or a woman of peace in every crowd. So be on the lookout. 
Yeah, that's the person. The one that's not cool toward you because you're a Christian, but the one that is kind of warm toward you. That's the one that you want to get alongside of and have a conversation with them. Who knows? You might even have the privilege of leading them to the Lord. Folks, this is the whole point of Christmas. We need the Lord. He was born to be a Savior to us and to offer us the gift of salvation. Somebody say amen. And once you and I have received that, that gift of salvation, naturally we want others to receive it as well. So may I simply say in all of our visiting, in all of our getting together with others that we care about, I say, Holy Spirit, lead us, prompt us. Holy Spirit, give us courage. Compel us with the love of Jesus Christ that we might very well make some, some, some progress in terms of influencing somebody else to find their place in the family of God. Can you say amen? Come on, stand to your feet, would you? So there you go, Gateway, in all of your Christmas partying over the weeks ahead. Be inclusive. Be forgiving. Be affectionate. Be comforted. Let the Lord comfort. Be a creator of wonderful memories. And whatever you do, be heads up. Be super perceptive. Watch for the man of peace or the woman of peace and see if the Lord won't help you to just engage with them. Pray for that person. Even invite them to come with you to the house of God. They may very well say, I would love that. Oh, yeah. You can be that agent of outreach in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, help us. Oh, amen. Father God, I just declare in Jesus' name that we would be crowned with such a grace for celebrating this phenomenal season that we call Christmas. Oh, Lord, as we rejoice in our spirit to say thank you. Thank you for coming to be a Savior for us. Help us, help us, Lord, to get together with others in very meaningful ways. Lord, I pray that every individual and every couple, every family, every household represented here today, Lord, I pray your presence be in our homes as, as we welcome others to come and visit with us. And, 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 and in those homes where we've been invited to come and visit with others, wherever we go, Lord, we declare that you are certainly with us. Lord, wherever we go, that we bring grace with us, that we bring the blessing of God with us, Lord Jesus, as we get together with others. May it be very special. Oh, Lord Jesus, may it be very special. May it be very healing, Lord. May it be very gratifying, Lord, as we work our way through this Christmas season. I declare this word of faith that we are coming out the other end of Christmas 2022 saying, wow, that was one of our best Christmases ever. Thank God for the invitation to get together with our dear, dear friend. Let's do it in Jesus' name. Lord, we just ask that you would be right at the very center, even if it's just two people getting together to do the honors, to say Merry Christmas to each other. Lord, that you be at the center of our conversation, that you be the one whose name is high and lifted up among us. Lord Jesus, we believe that you have called us to be men and women of koinonia. We believe that you have called us to walk in the love of Jesus Christ. And we're so up for that. We're so ready to do that, Lord. Holy Spirit, take this word of God that we've looked at together here today and cause it to be lodged deep down inside of every one of us. And in the, in, the, in the weeks ahead here, Lord, as we find ourselves in the context of a visiting situation, 
I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would remind us, oh yeah, oh yeah, get together, get together. Thank you, Lord, that your calling is upon my life to represent the name of Jesus in this Christmas gathering. Come on, before we officially wrap up our service, I want to have the privilege of leading you in the prayer of salvation. Come on, before we go from church today, let's affirm again that we belong to Jesus and all that He is is available to us. If you know that you need the Lord, it's entirely possible that there's individuals here today who have never made that all-important decision to say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I want to be born again. Or perhaps you need to recommit to Christ today. So with every head bowed, And every eye closed, here in person, for those who are watching online, if you know that you need to commit or recommit your life to Jesus today, before we all pray this prayer together, just a simple show of hands, if you know that you need the Lord, just wave at me wherever you are. Just wave at me. Yes, I see your hand on my left. Thank you. You can put it down. Are there others? Just wave to me. It's not embarrassing. It's your proudest moment when you say, Jesus, from now on, it's you and me. Anybody else before we pray this prayer together? All right. Come on, church. Yes, I see your hand at the back. Thank you. Good for you. You never regret the decision to start running around with Jesus. All right. Anybody else? Come on, church. Would you join me? Let's pray this prayer. Dear Jesus. I know that you're the Son of God. And I know you died on that cross. And you rose from the grave to be my Savior and friend. Forgive me, Lord, for all I've ever done wrong. Cleanse me with your blood. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live the Christian life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, somebody give the Lord some praise. Thank you for joining our online service today. We pray that this service was so encouraging to you from the very beginning to the very end. Hey, if you live in the Regina area and you haven't been to one of our in-person Sunday services, we'd love to have you join us one of these Sundays very soon. If you're not able to join us and tune in online, we'll see you again right here next Sunday. Have a great week.